Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate the attendance, especially for a uh, last talk of the day. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you about spear fishing, and we'll be looking through a bit of a story and understanding how fishing attacks work and uh, why they're so easy and why people would actually choose these over a more technical attack, for an example. So my name's Alex Arkendarkis. I work for Pentest People as a senior consultant. I specialize in web application and API technologies, but I have a genuine interest in the psychology of hacking, any sort of social engineering, basically the fun bits that I'm sure all the pen testers in the audience here love as well. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to be going through a few um, common vulnerabilities just to make sure that we're all on the same page for the non-pen testers in the room. So we're going to be having a look at software versions, brute force and multi-factor authentication, and weak passwords. So software versions are left on by default by many different softwares, um, and these versions are often seen as a low-hanging fruit for an attacker. It's very simple. Once we find software versions, we can go and look for pre-written publicly available exploits, click and play them a lot of the time, and there's very little effort required whatsoever and um, you can potentially get root system or, or any kind of exploitation that you're looking for from it. So here's an example of a server response header that has been caught from a web application using a tool called Burp Suite. Um, on here we can see that there is Microsoft IS 5.0. As I'm sure the pen testers will point out, an incredibly ancient version with thousands of versions, uh, well, a lot of vulnerabilities associated to it. So I thought it would be a good, uh, good version for this. So software versions are not only sent in server response headers and web applications. You can also find these by um, running a port scan against the network layer by using tools such as Nmap. Here's an example of an Nmap scan that's been returned that is showing the IIS web server 5.0 version. And we can also see here, just for jokes, that 445 TCP is open, which is the um, which is a service that was exploited during the NHS WannaCry attacks. So, as an attacker, once we actually have a software version, what is the next step? How do we find the next way? How do we find the exploit? So CVE details contains thousands and thousands of published exploits. You can search the software version on here and find anything to use against, in this case, the web application. So as we can see, these are just a few of the ones that have been found, including buffer overflows and denial of service attacks. Once we've looked on CVE details and we found that there are exploits related to it, we actually need the code to then compile and run and attack the target that we're looking for. ExploitDB is a website that you don't have to sign up for. It's publicly available, um, very easy to use, and it hosts code for exploits. Um, it also hosts, the a lot of the time, the vulnerable software um, alongside the exploit. So if anyone does really want to try and have a little play around with some hacking, go on ExploitDB, download the vulnerable software versions, download the exploit, fire them off yourself, and just see how actually very easy it is. So this is a little bit of a snippet from the um, Microsoft IIS uh, exploit. And here we can see a snippet of the eternal blue code that again was used in the NHS ransomware attacks. So software versions are incredibly easy to um, hide. So for example, in your Apache config, you can just turn server signatures off and your server tokens product only. So brute force and multi-factor authentication. A brute force attack in a web application scenario will typically start off by trying to enumerate a list of valid usernames. This can be done through different functionality within the web application, usually being the forgotten password function or the registration function. So when we go onto an application, we will try and register an account, and then afterwards we'll try and re-register it with the same email address to see what the error message is. If the error message returns to us as this account already exists, then we have a different response and we can use automated tools online to build lists of thousands of um, usernames or email combinations. There are many word lists around. This really isn't much work or much effort for any um, pen testers. Once we've got a list of valid usernames, we will then actually run brute force attacks against the login portal, against the password sections to try and get in. Again, there are readily available automated tools online that are very easy to do this. 
So multi-factor authentication is a second layer of authentication after we've used our standard username and password. This is often a screen that's asking for some kind of code that usually comes from Google Authenticator or SMS messages. Multi-factor authentication code should be treated exactly like passwords and not shared with anyone. Recently, I was doing an engagement for a pharmaceutical company, and um, we spoof. Well, we did. We got their domain, added Dash support on the end, just a nice classic, and registered it. And then we sent an email to their company saying that um, we have um, an important security update to be pushed that will require everyone to have Outlook web access, which is obviously rubbish to the majority of us, but a lot of people will fall for it. So we had a key logger on the portal that we redirected them to from the email, and um, we got two director level accounts for the pharmaceutical company. However, they had multi-factor authentication enabled. So I thought I'd take a long shot and phone one of them. And I was like, hi, I'm, I'm calling from IT support. We've you know, emailed you earlier. We've asked you to log into this. You've come back to us and told us you're having problems. Um, would you be able to read the code that I'm about to text through to your phone to me, please? And they read it straight away. So I decided, why not try and see if I can get another method for them to give it to me like this? So I sent a push notification called them and said, we're sending a push notification to your phone just to confirm it's you before we can start asking you a few more questions. They pressed the push notification without any argument whatsoever. So we have to start treating multi-factor authentication tokens as passwords. So as we can see, brute force attacks are simple to set up and execute. It's only a matter of time and computing power until we actually get through unless there's um, some form of protection. The protection is quite easy. You can add a um, capture. You can use account lockout policies. And ideally, you should always have multi-factor authentication enabled on logins. Whilst this isn't always possible, I think the more as an industry, if we can really start pressing the importance of multi-factor authentication, then web applications in general will become a lot more secure. Uh, mitigates against password reuse in, in, in an essence, because um, even if you log in through the first layer, you're not going to get into the second. So there are a lot of options now, mainly being SMS and Google Authentication uh, uh, Authenticator. So weak passwords. Passwords have been a talking topic of the security industry, I guess, since the first day, and there are many myths surrounding it. So Take this with a bit of a pinch of salt because it's come from how secure is my password online, so I don't know the full accuracy. <laughs> um, but it gives a bit of a rough idea on, on the computational power that is actually required to crack passwords. So here's your typical, pass, uh, typical weak password of the word password, um, which would be cracked instantly by, um, by dictionary attacks and very quickly by any kind of true brute force attacks. So... Does using complexity on weak passwords make them stronger? Yes, but not by that much. You can add more complexity, you can change things up, but it really doesn't make it stronger, uh, much stronger. So passphrases, I'm sure everyone in here or most of the people in here have now heard about passphrases at one point or another. Passphrases are multiple words with spaces in between them. Um, and this is a lot easier for the human brain to actually remember in, in, in a psychological point of view. Because remembering three words with spaces or dashes is a lot easier than remembering one word with seven hashtags, four semicolons, and a couple of commas involved in it. A minimum length of 10 characters should be in place for low privilege users and a minimum length of 16 characters should be in place for high-privileged users. So here's an example of a passphrase being used, which has now gone from instantly to one minute to 454 billion years. So the computational mathematics behind it shows that it will take a lot longer, and even better yet, add some complexity in there as well. So... Now we can move on to the main part, social media, spear phishing, and how to protect yourself. 
We're going to start off by having a little look at the threat landscape, understanding what spear phishing is, a bit of the motivation behind it, some scary facts and statistics, a case study, and then how to protect against spear phishing. We are going to be giving away some lockpick sets at the end of this talk to people that can answer questions about the talk. So do pay attention and don't fall asleep if you want free lockpicks, that is. So let's have a look at the threat landscape. Between October 2013 and May 2018, businesses inside and outside of the US lost over $12.5 billion to email business compromise. 2015 was really a, a massive year for ransomware um, with over 752% increase and ransomware families jumping from 29 to 247. Ransomware is still increasing rapidly. What is business email compromise? So business email compromise is a form of fraud and it plays off natural human psychological uh, urges. So I would send, an, so you'd spoof, uh, spoof a C-suite employee, so a chief executive officer or chief operating officer or, or whatever officers there are these days, um, and you'd email through to a financial director asking them to deposit X amount of money quickly before we lose a license, for example. So the average loss is $140,000. Leona AG lost $44.6 million from one point of business email compromise. In, 2006, in 2018, business email compromise rose by about 46%, or reported email business compromise rose by about uh, 46%. What is ransomware? So ransomware payloads are usually delivered by email. A user will click a link or download an attachment um, or, or some form of trickery involved. Um, and the ransomware will then encrypt all of the files on the computer and demand money, um, usually in the for payment form of Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or some form of cryptocurrency to actually unlock the files. Um, I saw quite a lot of cases where people actually did pay to get their files unlocked and never got given a key to unlock their files. So what is spear phishing? Spear phishing, unlike regular phishing, targets individuals and specific people. It has, uh, the attacker will actually spend some time researching, understanding the person that they're going to attack and building a profile. You'll understand their family's needs, their, their hobbies, um, pretty much everything that they do, anything that you can do to build an overall profile. There are three main payloads in here. Technical payloads, which is usually ransomware or some form of malware. Psychological payloads, which is business email compromise or any other kind of do this now because someone's emailing you from a higher, higher level account. Um, either or both, which is just a, a spoof password reset or some form of keylogger. So what is the motivation behind spear phishing? Spear phishing is incredibly easy to set up and execute. It doesn't take up much time and the rewards can be absolutely massive. Um, we'll talk about a case study a little bit later where you'll be able to see some of the real effects of spear phishing and how much money it can actually make. So why spear phishing really? So we've all received normal mass phishing emails that are clearly sent out to thousands of people that are written in poorly, uh, they're in poorly written English, probably trying to sell you some kind of penis extension medication or or something that is uh, you know something terrible along those lines maybe some uh, Russian male brides as well um, <laughs> so the the um, difference between these emails are they are not obvious they are well made they look authentic and they're correctly crafted the URL sorry the email address that it's coming from will not look fake it will no longer be dear valued customer and there are a couple of other mistakes in there that I'm sure people would notice, like regard at the bottom. So how can we actually start building better emails that people are more likely to fall for and more likely to understand? So an example that I like to use is a C-suite employee goes on um, holiday and posts a picture of them on the beach and they have their hotel name in the background. So we've gone on Twitter and we found this um, we found the hotel name and we know that they were there during certain dates. 
I'll then send an email to the hotel asking them a very generic question like, do you have gym facilities or what time does your bar close or the usual important questions. And when they reply to you, we'll then analyze the language and the way that the email response is written to us, grab the email footer and um, any information that we can actually grab from the email return to us and then send an email to the C-suite employee that has um, tweeted the picture of them at the hotel. And we'll be exploiting a trust relationship here. Because they've been there before, they know the hotel, they don't understand why people know they were in the hotel. So our email will say, we found some high value goods in your room. Um, please either click on this link or download this to have a look at them. And if they are yours, then we'll return them to you um, very quickly. People naturally will click on that. They're scared that they've lost something. Maybe even they're a bad person. They're thinking, can I steal something here? Can I say that something was mine? Um, in which case, then it's a good thing that we're uh, fishing them. So let's have a look at some fairly scary facts and statistics. Two-thirds of all malware arrives via email attachments. Sophisticated phishing emails facilitate 90% of successful attacks. 97% of people cannot differentiate an authentic email from a well-crafted fake one. This is a statistic that I'm focusing on the most for this presentation. Whilst the other ones show the effect of it and the powerfulness of it, this is showing that actually, if you write things in good English and it looks genuine, then people probably are going to click on it. So 56% of email recipients and 40% of Facebook users clicked on a link from an unknown sender because of curiosity. They didn't know what was on there, but they wanted to know, so they still clicked on it, even knowing the risks. So let's have a little bit of a look at a case study. A very famous hacking group called Carbonac, who have been around for a little while, and they have stolen billions and billions of dollars now um, in total. And I believe one person has been arrested, but I don't think anyone's ever actually been charged. So if we compare this to jewellery heists of 30 million, where everyone, well, the majority of the time they're caught, in comparison to a hacker stealing billions and never being caught, we can really see why spear phishing is so good. So the Carbonac group. Uh, attack banking institutions, and they started with um, spear phishing emails. Once they were on the network, they'd run some form of manual reconnaissance, uh, recording everything that was typed by staff, some video footage, CCTV footage, webcams, that kind of thing, to ensure that they can um, actually understand how everything's working and how everything um, inside is actually operating so that they can try and impersonate a genuine member of staff. Large sums of money were transferred through ATMs, a SWIFT network, and creating high-value bank accounts. But here's a slide that I've liberated from Kaspersky. Um, they were actually the company that investigated this attack. Uh, if you add me on Twitter at the end or go to my Twitter at the end, I have posted an interview um, with the guy that investigated the Carbonac attacks. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, really interesting. So... We start off at the beginning where Carbonac is sent as a backdoor email attachment to a bank employee. Previously, they've discovered that this bank is running an old version of Microsoft Word internally by using standard forms of OSINT tools such as a, a Bluto or, or a few others that will scrape the metadata from files online and um, that have been uploaded by people from that company. So the backdoor attachment um, would exploit a vulnerability in the Microsoft Word version that would give system access. So the employees downloaded this and they've got system access on one computer. They've sent it to quite a few other people and they've got a load of computers. But at this point, there is no administrative credentials to get onto the domain controller. So they used one of the compromised computers to send an email to the IT administrators complaining that one of the computers that had been um, infected was very slow and they wanted them to come and have a look at it. The IT administrators came and had a look and there was a key logger on the login portal. So they now have administrative access and they've got complete control of the um, they've got control of the domain controller. They own the infrastructure. They can pretty much do whatever they want from this time. So now that you're inside a bank, how do you get the money out without being caught? 
or without being caught quickly and giving you enough time to actually be able to get out a decent sum of money. So there were four different methods that were used by Parbonet. Online banking, so sending money outside of the, uh, outside of the countries to maybe Caymans or, or any kind of tax haven places. Um, e-payment systems, inflating bank balances, but my personal favorite, controlling ATMs. So they lay a bit of malware down that would go into the ATMs and um, they'd hired a load of thugs to uh, go to banks with special cards that would trigger the malware and spit all of the money out of the ATMs. Um, after reading about this, I uh, ended up researching ATM hacking a little bit more and apparently it's quite easy. Um, you can a, a lot of ATMs you can buy a uh, generic default key online that allows you to unlock them and once you unlock them you've got a USB port. Not that I'm encouraging anyone to go around hacking ATMs but I'm just saying it's probably easier than we think. So they would go and collect this money and then drop the money off to um, whoever was controlling them um, and yeah, they took over a billion dollars on this bank. Um, I believe this one was, it was, it was a billion dollars worth of ru rubies or rubles, um, that they ended up stealing. So how do we protect against spear phishing? Don't share personal information online. Um, try and keep as much uh, it's easier said than done we all want to put things on Facebook every now and then um, show off that we're on holiday for example but just try and be considerate and try and really think if someone saw this on my social media could they use this to exploit some form of trust relationship that I have with maybe a third party or maybe uh, something that I'm interested in report any suspicious emails contact the sender before you download anything and contact the sender before you click on any links. So, now's the fun bit, see who is actually listening. And we'll be giving out some lock picks for this. Um, so, can anyone tell me how often is malware sent as an attachment? Yes, two thirds. So yeah. According to Verizon, two-thirds of all malware arrives via email attachments. What percentage of sophisticated cyber attacks start with the phishing email? 90. Correct. How many people from the Carbonac uh, group have been charged? One. Have been charged. One was at risk, but no one's been charged yet. Okay. What should the minimum password length be for a low privileged user account? <laughs> Are we going to start that debate? <laughs> of course. Anyone want to answer? Why that? Yeah. So, 10 characters. Obviously, this recommendation may vary uh, depending on company to company, but um, 10 characters are usually your standard for very low privilege user accounts that don't have um, easy access to really doing any damage to either an application or, or infrastructure. <laughs> What should the maximum password length be? <laughs> nope. Yeah, 60. Cheers, no problem. So, has anyone got any questions for me about the presentation? Pardon? <laughs> there are. <laughs> They'll be given out some of the uh, questions. Yep. Yep. 
No, if you can research a person, you can understand, then yes. But we recommend to use password lockers, which will be randomly generating passphrases for you. Um, that's a really good point, actually. They use passphrases because it's all it's dictionary based, but a lot of the time the password lockers will choose your passphrase, but they'll throw some random complexity into there and some random bits to to break up words so that they're not necessarily um, true words at that point. It's a great question. Yes. Well, there's thousands of people, so we'll we'll start off by going through their LinkedIn, and we'll run some tools that will bring uh, sort of all the employees back on LinkedIn, and we'll start with the obvious. We get rid of the IT department get rid of anyone technical, and then we'll try and break it down usually to um, focus on employees that have been there for less than three months or less than two months, as they likely wouldn't have had any security awareness or phishing training at that point. Um, but it's a matter of just filtering and filtering and filtering until you get down to the five, maybe ten people that you'd actually choose. Oh, then, then you'll research them individually as a person. Um, so if I'd chosen to, to focus on you for a spear phishing attack, I'd go to your, your Facebook, your Twitter, your LinkedIn, um, read your local newspapers, see if you've ever been in there, for example. Uh, if you, if you have interest in football, then I know that that's a potential exploit point that I can go into. Um, and yeah, just researching the person as a specific individual to understand them. Non-financially motivated. Um, yeah. So, in in terms of in terms of actual research that I've read, I'm not aware of any, but I could see how it could be used. So. Um, Usually when there's no monetary value involved in attack, there has to be something else involved in it. It could be uh, an attacker that has a massive ego that's just doing it for fun, but it would most likely in that case be either a competitor or someone that would have that would benefit in some way of actually um, either knocking down your infrastructure or getting into your, your um, email accounts. No, I'm not aware of any research specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, almost all. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the only way that we're ever going to be able to really tackle spear phishing is um, security awareness training. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you could potentially, but the codes reset every 60 seconds if you're using Google Authenticator. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I wouldn't know how to go appro about approaching that one, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah. Evil Jinx. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, interesting. One moment. This is the last one I'm giving out. <laughs> so I can hear the disappointment. Yep. A 
a comfortable amount of data to gather is until you are personally comfortable that you know that person well enough that if you were to have a conversation with them person to person, for example, you'd know ways to be able to lead the conversation, to be able to trick them and, and steer them. It's a little bit how long is a piece of string in that sense because you might come across a really, really vulnerable target, a really easy target, um, but you might end up so someone that's posted really obvious information about themselves online that you can use to exploit. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. It's usually down to whether the company is doing security awareness training or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, if, if people are not reusing passwords, and I can definitely understand the um, less rotation. If you're using a 25-character password, you're only using it in one place, you're 100% sure it's being stored in uh, an encrypted format, um, then yes, potentially. But the reality is that most people reuse passwords. Um, websites don't always store your data in clear te I I encrypted. And um, I'm sure most of the people in this room have used Have I Been Pooned on one of their old email accounts and found at least one or two leaks that, that they've been in. Um, so in a, in a perfect scenario, yes. But I just think, unfortunately, the human element makes it a little bit more difficult than, than just doing that. Do you, by password history, do you mean so you um, what, don't have to rotate pass? I mean, I guess it means that um, it, it really depends on the company specifically, I think, um, how their employees are, how well the uh, any security awareness training has affected them, and um, how their kind of setup is. Um, I think it should be looked at on more of an individual case-to-case -case basis as opposed to um, just deciding straight away. But I think rotating passwords does have its merit, um, but that is usually because of password reuse attacks that have been coming out of clear text leaks and that kind of thing. Um, so it, if people aren't using their password in multiple places and they're not reusing, then yeah, you, you can get rid of the... Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, they also used to say that um, complexity was more important than length in terms of computational power. Um, so I think everything needs to take with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Um, I, I personally, my personal view is that um, passwords should be rolled over and they should be changed and there should be a policy that is um, forcing people to reset their password every maybe six months to a year. Um, I know three months was thrown around for a while at one point, but I think it's being increased quite a lot now by most companies. But I, I don't see why re forcing users to change a password could actually be a negative thing if they're using a password locker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in what sense? Not really. I mean, on a typical penetration testing engagement where we're doing phishing campaigns, um, we'll, we'll ask to be whitelisted. On a web application test when we're testing, we'll ask to be whitelisted. This isn't this is in a um, standard penetration test as opposed to red teaming. Uh, this is because we're looking to test the vulnerabilities, the code itself, or the humans themselves, if they're going to click on it, as opposed to testing someone's uh, defenses or, or anything that they've got in place over there. Yeah. So spam filters are great. They should always be used, but there's no guarantee that the... Um, well, I've seen, uh, fr from our experience, we'll, we'll usually ask to be whitelisted in an engagement um, through through any spam filters. Uh, but I've I've seen recently that um, people have been putting JPEGs or PNGs pasted into emails. 
Um, and as opposed to having it just in normal text, it's actually an image that's inside it. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that people are trying to bypass different uh, spam filters at the moment. Yep. Personally, um, not to my knowledge, <laughs> but if, if, if they've done it well enough, then I won't know. <laughs> Anyone else? I am not. <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely getting social engineered a bit by the partner at the moment, so it's probably me. <laughs> yes. No. No. Uh, typically, if a company's never had a phishing engagement or, or any security awareness training, you'll get plus 50% click rate, um, and that'll get lower and lower with the amount that, that it goes down. But, I mean, it does depend on the company, so that's not an exact statistic. But from my previous experience, it's usually roughly 50. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Do they? Okay, yeah. Oh, that would be really interesting. I'll definitely have a look at that. Awesome. Cool. Anyone else? Um, secure, uh, security awareness training is the only way to, to really tackle it fully. Um, we should try and ensure that the language that is used in emails that are coming through to us. So often when you're at work, for example, if you're emailing a friend, you use slightly different language. Um, it's analyzing and looking for these kinds of things, but the only real thing to, to prevent spear phishing is to um, have a real staff awareness, security awareness training program and regular phishing campaigns. It's, it's definitely paying off. So when, when we've typically been doing a phishing engagement for a company, um, we'll, we'll do three or four, maybe five, and we see significant changes between each one. Um, yeah. That we're doing the phishing engagements against. Um, so the one, the one that I used as an example earlier is a big pharmaceutical company. So massive. It, it can really vary from from small media, from small businesses, small mediums to large financial institutions. Uh, last question, if there is one, yes, please. Can you bring them up? So one of the things that we recommend is if you have a phishing assessment done, uh, you actually show those users. You don't shame them. There's, there's no need to shame that user because if they haven't had the training, then there's no point in, in firing it with fire, basically. So the best thing to do is to show them what their actions led to. So if we fished a CEO, let's say, and they've had no phishing uh, training or they've had you know, the bare minimum, show them because of your actions – you know, this malicious attacker managed to steal your passport number, your credit card information, the the, com the, the, the crown jewels, basically, of the company. And it makes them think a bit more. And then they start to apply that mentality to their own personal emails because, you know, that's where it's going to kick in the most, really. Yeah, makes sense. Yep, thank you very much. Cool, thank you very much, guys.